Hey, what's up, folks? Well, back again for another fight card prediction, and we're going to break down a doozy of a card. UFC 217 from Madison Square Garden in New York City, as the middleweight championship is on the line, as the bantamweight championship is on the line, and as the women's strawweight championship is on the line. Three title fights here is headlining this card as they make the return to MSG after last year's extravaganza with Conor McGregor and Eddie Alvarez and Joanna and JJ Woodley and. Um, Thompson, great, great card. So it's got something to kind of live up to if it's going to be like last year's card. But overall, a really solid fight card from kind of top to bottom. There's good fights in the fight pass portion of the card. There's good fights in the prelims. And then there's good fights throughout the main card, including your three title fights, obviously. So, yeah, looking forward to talking about that card. Coming off pretty solid week at the UFC Sao Paulo. Kind of the last three picks kind of let me down. But we move on here. Um, that was a good card last week in all honesty as well, I really really enjoyed it, got me in the mood for this card, just a, I know I will be making my other fight card predictions for Pori vs Pettis this week, as from Sunday I'm on holidays, vacation for two weeks, um, so I'm going to get that out nice and early because I'm going back home to see my parents and spend some time there and uh, take my little baby girl down to meet the rest of my other side of my family, so yeah looking forward to that. Um, Again, thank you so much for the subscribers. We're like 25, I think we're 25 or 27 away from um, hitting that 1500 before the end of the year. I think we're going to hit it fairly convincingly. So thank you to all the new subscribers. Really do appreciate it. MMA Huddle, my podcast that we, that we do week in, week out. We review the previous week's card. We look ahead to the next card. We take your questions. If you've ever got any questions, just let me know uh, on Twitter on here and uh, we'll get them answered for you in the podcast we're probably going to be doing a couple of different things this week as well we're going to be doing something before the fights on saturday afternoon and uh, we're probably going to be doing something during the main card remember we're going to do like a like a fight companion where we're watching the fights and talking about the fights we are uh, probably the last three fights of championship fights because i would have done it earlier but my little baby girl gets fed around 3 4 a.m in the morning so um, it maybe times itself out right for the the championship fights, but uh, nonetheless, come and give us a, a subscribe on on YouTube. We're on iTunes, we're on SoundCloud, we're on Podcast uh, One, I think it is. So we're all over the place. MMA Huddle, you'll find us there. So we're going to get into this card. I say really, really good card. Lots of great, great fights. I'm looking forward to speaking about. Starting off down with Eamon Zahabi facing off against the young pretender in the bantamweight division. Ricardo Ramos. Now we'll start with Ricardo Ramos. Really young kid, like 21 years old. Um, really impressed me in his debut. I thought there was definitely some aspects of his skill set that you need to shore up a little bit. But I thought he was solid. I mean, Mishinori Tanaka, although not the greatest fighter in the world, I thought that he did enough in that fight against a guy who is tough he is the japanese fighters are always tough and they're hard to get out of there and uh, being so young as well he was a big underdog i cashed that bet actually i was pretty confident in him in that pick and uh, i cashed a nice underdog play there uh, and just i like i like his game i think in a few years time i think he's going to be a really solid fighter i think he's going to be a, a ranked fighter in that bantamweight division but he is still young, he is still pretty green, and I do think there is a lot of fighters that could potentially beat him in this division because it's a short tank of a division, it's the bantamweights. Um, he's against Damon Zahabi, who, um, for us, Zahabi's brother, obviously, he didn't really impress me in his debut. I thought he started off round one very well, and then the durability of Hedginaldo Vera really came to the kind of four in that fight, and uh, he took a lot of licks towards the end of that fight. Vera was coming into it more than what Zahabi was really controlling it. So, um, yeah, I, I started off impressed. I, I liked the tape before he went to UFC, but he, he is making step up in opponents um, from skill class to, to what he was facing on the regionals. So, here, I, I'm struggling. I really, I've wanted to pick Ricardo Ramos, but I'm being pushed towards Zahabi. Um, and I think Ricardo Ramos is going to be a big underdog. So, I'm not sure. I wanted to pick Ricardo Ramos, but I'm going to stick with what I'm kind of being pushed to, and that's Eamon Zahabi. I think um, he can control. I think he was maybe a little bit nervous in that first fight, and he, he was overshooting on his shots, and um, just he didn't look 
seen that it's a big step up going from the regionals to the UFC. So maybe he he, he got a, bit of a shock of the the talent that he he was facing with Vera, who is very very durable. I don't think that Ramos has the durability what Hedronaldo Vera has. So I think that um, Zahabi will try and just play an all around decent game. Um, an all-around MMA game in this fight here. Look to take it to the ground, try and control down there. Ramos is very dangerous down there, though. He's a guy that I had my eye on and before he came to the UFC in LFA. He was facing Manny Vasquez. Looked like he was going to get his shot there and lost that fight, I think, in the first round via sub. Um, I'm going to go Zahabi. I'm going to go a, a very, very close 29-28 decision. But honestly, guys, I think Ricardo uh, Ramos is live. I think if you want an underdog play that... Possibly could hit plus 200. Ricardo Ramos might be a really good bet for this card. Uh, I think that uh, there'll be some short people probably picking him. I just feel a little bit better picking Eamon Zahabi uh, in this fight. and uh, But I do think it's going to be close. I really do. So the pick's going to be Zahabi. I might actually go a split decision. I'm going to go a split decision win for Eamon Zahabi. Light heavyweight division with Ovin St. Pru against uh, Corey Anderson. OSP's coming here very, very short notice after Pat Cummins um, had to pull out with that gruesome injury, the staph infection. I think it was on his foot. Brutal, brutal looking injury. Um, just did not look good at all. OSP flattens to deceive me every fight. I've watched him live. Sometimes he, he, he turns up, he looks good. Sometimes he's very, very flat. And uh, coming off that win over Yushin Okami with that beautiful Von Flew choke, which he seems to... He's just got the knack of of, of really finding that submission. Um, but I think Corey Anderson's live here. I OSP just does not impress me. It, some, it, it's hard saying that because sometimes when he shows up, he is actually quite impressive to watch. But other times when he doesn't, like at Ustamir, um and other occasions as well, he struck. sometimes he just does not show up and he is... He's, his opponents are very, very live. The one thing that I will say, which I forgot to say at the top there, is the DraftKings prices are out. So I've been looking at making some um, lineups, and Corey Anderson is really cheap, 7,200, and I think he can survive this fight. I think he can go on a takedowns. Whether he wants to do that against OSP, who is a, a really dangerous guy on the ground with his, um, his submissions, with pretty much with a Von Flew choke, but um, I think Corey Anderson can get takedowns in this guy. But I'm just a little bit wary about picking Corey Anderson because all it takes is one shot to put this guy down, like Jimmy Manawa did. Now, I know Manawa is a far better striker than um, what Corey Anderson is, uh, what OSP is, I think, anyway. But I just think that something that's pushing me away from Corey Anderson, but I don't really want to pick him here. But I think OSP... It's just a little bit more well-rounded at this point. I think in a few years, Corey Anderson could be like Ovin St. Pru. Sometimes if he, when OSP shows up, he looks half-decent. But other times, he just looks like utter dog shit. So, um, do I go with Corey Anderson? See, see I think this fight's going to be really, really close. I don't see this being a definitive one-way type of fight for like OSP. I've seen people say on Twitter and Facebook and some of the, the threads that I see online that OSP is going to absolutely run through Corey Anderson. And that could happen in any fight. But I think Corey Anderson, I mean, he needs to prove a lot coming off that loss to Jimmy Mano in London, where he got put down with that one shot with a, with a big swing and left, put him down. I think Corey Anderson's live. And it's probably a dog or pass moment. So I'm going to pick Corey Anderson. Huge underdog, I think he's going to be. Um, well, maybe not huge, maybe a plus 150, plus 160 uh, dog when it comes around. I'm going to pick Corey Anderson. I, I'm just, sometimes OSP does not show up. This could be a card where he shows up. I mean, he took no damage in that Okami fight. Okami fought really stupidly and uh, pretty much gave OSP that fight by rushing in for a takedown and being too aggressive. So I'm going to go Corey Anderson via decision. Uh, it's not going to be one of my most confident picks, but I just think in a fight where... Sometimes OSP does not show up. That Corey Anderson is he's tough and he's gritty and he can stick around um, in certain fights as long as he doesn't get caught. Because OSP, to his credit, he does have big kicks, big uh, body kicks, which is something you've got to look out for. But Anderson can maybe capitalise on those with takedowns. I can see OSP getting back to his feet. 
and then it's kind of a rinse repeat with a few takedowns. I think it's going to be close though, so I'm going to go 29-28 for Corey Anderson. Um, just feel more confident picking him instead of OSP. OSP, I've seen with my own two eyes at UFC 204 that sometimes he doesn't show up and he wasn't really the nicest guy to be around either in the hotel when I was speaking to his coach, um, who was lovely, he was a really nice guy, but I'm going to go Corey Anderson, 29-28 decision. Heavyweight division, your main fight of the UFC Fight Pass portion of this card. We have Alexei Olenek against Curtis Blades. Interesting fight, really interesting fight because I continue to write off Alexei Olenek and he continues to kind of deceive me and win fights and um, beats better guys. Being honest, he's moving on and beating better guys. I mean, Travis Brown was a good guy a few years ago, but he's like not the fighter he was back then. But he's still a tough guy to put He's a big dude. He, he hits hard and you have to be very careful. Curtis Blade's the guy I'm actually pretty high on. I, I don't think his uh, last performance kind of didn't do much for him against Daniel Lomilanchuk. Really did not look good. But he's a big athletic heavyweight who is has got freakish strength and can toss you around like we've seen at Adam Milstead. Now Milstead had no real right being in the UFC heavyweight division. But he still got his comeuppance against Curtis Blades, and I think Curtis Blades can do that to a lot of guys in that division if he can get his hands on you. But I do like his quickness with his strikes, I like his variety with his strikes, and I think he's still a young fighter, he's only been in the sport a couple of years, but he's going to gr slowly, gradually move his way up that uh, UFC heavyweight division and become a very dangerous fighter in my opinion. I think um, this is a good good test for him here against Alexei Olenek. Olenek. Um, what can we say about Olenek? Uh, been around for a long time, I think it's like in his 40s, submission guy, like literally this guy's got a death grip and he, he finds submissions from nowhere, we've seen that with the Pesta fight, you have no right submitting a guy from off your back with your with, with the choke that he caught him with, he has no right whatsoever with, the, with that choke but he still caught it so he's dangerous down there but I think you, if you can survive the early exchanges and uh, just beat him in the feet because his striking's non-existent. He's, he overreaches with his strikes, very flat-footed, um, and I think it, uh, with the right kind of striker, he, he can be put down easy. Is Curtis Blades that guy? I'm not entirely sure it is, but um, I do think he can get. I think as long I think this fight in the first round, obviously all that's going to want to try and clinch and try and get this to the ground, put him against the cage, make it nasty. I think that Curtis Blades can get the wizard, turn him around potentially get a takedown but he has to be so so careful because Olenek has found so many key locks Ezekiel chokes in his career that if you leave something open this guy pounces on it and he takes you out he taps you out he puts you to sleep so um more confident in Curtis Blades I think he can wear out Alexei Olenek late in this fight and get a finish with takedowns and heavy heavy ground and pound but he has to be very 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 uh, careful with what he's doing on the, on the ground with Olenek but I think the, the play for me is going to be Curtis Blades via TKO in early round number three there. So good start to the fights um, with uh, those on Fight Pass. Moving on to Fox Sports 1 card. Welterweight division, we have Randy Brown against Mickey Gull. Ooh, uh, I'm very, very confident in Randy Brown in this one. I'm not on the hype train on Mickey Gall at all. I've seen people who think Mickey Gall is like the next coming of a fighter somewhere. Um... This guy is beat a pro wrestler, he's beat a reporter, and pretty much just like a poster boy in Sage Northcote. Now Northcote has some skills, some skills, um, but I don't, I still don't rate Mickey Gall. I do think he has a really good ground game, which he's shown in the UFC, um, and he's got a penchant for uh, finding submissions and being really, really good down there. I think on the feet, I think Randy Brown's going to be long. I think he's going to be quicker. I think he's going to have more variety about him. Um, and he's fought the better calibre of fighters. There's no doubt about it in his UFC tenure. Bilal Muhammad's a tough guy. You don't... Um, he lost that via decision, so he went all 15 minutes with a, a really tough guy who, who can mix it up well, can get takedowns. Um, was a smaller guy in that fight, but it really did... I thought Brown did well. He's still really early in his career as well, but he has got a couple of UFC wins against lower ranked guys, I mean Brian Camozzi and Eric Montano is not um, wins that are really going to leap off there, I mean Matt Dwyer is another one, I think he's even retired now, so his two losses are to Michael Graves and to Bilal Mohamed, 
Graves the guy I think is a solid solid fighter um, if he gets his shit together and everything I think he's a, a really solid fighter um, I just think that Randy Brown we've not seen him in a while I think that we're going to um, I just think he's going to put a bit of a beat down on Mickey Gall. I, I think if Mickey can't get it to the ground, I don't think he's got the striking to compete with Randy Brown. The one thing that I didn't like about Randy Brown, he came out and said that he got too confident in that fight with Bilal Muhammad. He thought he underestimated Bilal Muhammad. And as a young guy in the sport, I don't think you should be doing that with tough guys. If you watch the tape on Bilal Muhammad, you will know he's a tough, gritty, hard-nosed fighter who can take a lick and keep on coming. Um, so hopefully his confidence is in the right spot. I like Randy Brown in this one. I think I hope the odds are going to be fairly decent. I have bets for this card. I have two bets for on the main card, and I have another one which I might do for this card and UFC 218. I think it is the next one. So um, yeah, I like Randy Brown. I think he can stop Mickey Gall. Uh, can he stop him? Yeah, I think he can. I'm going to go a, a TQ victory, <clears throat> maybe late round two, early round number three. I just think that length. And fighting at range and catching Mickey Gall and busting him up a little bit will t start to take its toll. And uh, Mickey might start shooting for takedowns and eating some shots through there as well. So Randy Brown's going to be the pick there. Fairly confident in, in him as well, which I was a little bit surprised at. But once I watched the tape um, of both guys, there really should only be one winner in this fight. No less Mickey Gall is seriously well um, got his game together and taken up a few levels. I just think that Randy Brown... This is the time that he's going to stop the hype trainer, kind of Mickey Gall, whatever hype train he, he really has, which is not that much. But um, <clears throat> Randy Brown's going to be the pick there. Eon Kutalab against Mikhail uh, Alexei Shuk. Uh, I don't know if I, I probably mispronounced that name. I'm not great with that name. I've heard it a few times. But yeah, um, short short uh, replacement here for Alexei uh, Zhuk. I think I, I need to get that name right. Um, we'll call him Mikhail. Um, coming in here for Gazimurad uh, Antigulov. I thought that was going to be a great fight. That was actually a fight I was thoroughly looking forward to seeing. And uh, yeah, that fight got to put to the side. I was actually liking Antigulov in that fight. But I'm heavy, heavy favouring um, Ion Kutalaba here. From what I've seen of uh, Mikhail, the Polish guy, 12 and 2 record. I saw his fight against uh, Ricardo Zongulia and I seen there was another one, I can't remember what his name was now, but um, nothing really jumps off off the page with, with this guy. He's getting his opportunity here and a, a huge card, I mean a huge spot in the prelims as well, televised prelims against Kutilaba. But I think they have something with this Kutilaba guy, I really do. I think he, he can bring exciting fights to this division and he can be something in a few years maybe in that being a ranked heavy, light heavyweight. So we've seen that in the fight with um, Enrique De Silva. He came out just throwing bombs and put the guy down very, very early. I like watching this guy fight. I think his aggression, um, his willingness to throw bombs is uh, pretty awesome. He does gas out pretty bad. We've seen that in the Karanir fight where uh, he expends a lot of energy. So, But I think he's going to come out big. I think he's going to really look to take this guy out. And I think he can do it fairly, fairly, fairly quick as well. So um, I'm actually really looking forward to seeing this guy fight again. But Kutalaba, I'm going to go with a first round stoppage. I think he can hurt him in the feet and then he, he'll beat him with some ground and pound. Um, and that's one of my most confident picks in the card as well. Um, so yeah. Heavyweight division. Walt Harris against Mark Godby. Now this fight was supposed to take place at UFC 216. And we all know the shenanigans that went down there with um, Derek Lewis getting back spasms. And then Mark Godbeer got shifted to the side and they moved Walt Harris to face for Brutes of Doom. Now, for Walt Harris, that's really... You take that opportunity. If, if it's your day and you beat one of the best heavyweights of all time, then you put yourself deep into that UFC heavyweight rankings. Um, literally showed nothing. Got taken down, got submitted, uh, was fairly blase about it as well he was quite uh, funny with it he says like do you get a participation trophy for for going in a fight which i thought was quite funny um if you watch the 216 preview i was heavily favoring walt harris nothing really changes i think that i like the fact that mark godby has got the opportunity to to come onto this card in a big card in new york um after getting that fight pulled last month um i just think that walt's going to be a little bit too 
uh, athletic. I think he hits harder. Um, this fight would get really interesting, like I said the last time out. If this fight goes into the late second, third round, I think that Godbia could come into it and potentially win that fight. But I'm just not confident in picking Mark Godby. I hope, I actually hope he wins, but uh, the head is saying Walt Harris is going to be too athletic, just a little bit too fast, um, and win this fight. So I think he, he will, he can tiki on Mark Godby, uh, maybe late in the first, early in the second. I'm going to go early in the second. If not, he could potentially win a decision, but I do think Godby can come into it later this fight goes, but Harris is going to be the pick there. This is the fight I'm really looking forward to. I think this is my second favourite fight. Oh, that's a hard one. Second stroke third favourite fight in the card. Um, it's a close second, maybe. James Vick against Joseph Duffy. Now, this is a great fight. Two savages outside the UFC top 15 light in, in the lightweight division. That The lightweight guys, I don't think, really want to... The lightweight rank guys, I think these are danger men outside of that top 15 that you don't really want to face. Both guys... Have really good skill sets, both guys, especially James Vick. He's very underrated. People are people underrate that guy so much. He's got a great record. He's got a great skill set. He's long. He's a big guy. He has a, a terrible weight cut to. It's a it's a tough not a bad weight cut. He has a, a tough weight cut to get down there. I saw him at 197 uh, and did not look good. But he's 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 professional. He gets down to his weight um, and he and he performs. He did last time against Polo Reyes. Now he is getting the jump in competition here against Joseph Duffy. You go from Abel Trujillo to Polo Reyes, which I think was a step down, to Joseph Duffy, who I think is a, a couple of levels up at least on those two guys. Um, Joseph Duffy, I'm a big fan of Joseph Duffy. Really great technical boxer, great submission skills, comes from a good camp, very disciplined uh, across the board, I think he can find the chin of James Vick. That's what scares me a little bit. But I think this is going to be James Vick's coming out party. I really do. I think. Um, oh, it's a tough. That is such a tough fight to pick because I say I like Duffy, and I think. Oh, I'm gonna. My pick is going to be James Vick, and I'm going to get that out of the the way. Get that out there right now. Um, and I believe he'll probably be the underdog in this fight from what I'm kind of hearing and seeing with some of the betting lines, people saying suggested lines of what they're going to be. Um, but this is a tough fight for Joseph Duffy. I mean, Vic, with, a, with his dimensions in there, with his range, with his reach, um, with his, like, he can keep you at distance, but he's got great boxing as well. But that Darius fight, it does skip into my head, but everybody has to take that first loss in the UFC. It was just a bad knockout that he received. I mean, Duffy got pretty much dominated against Dustin Poirier, even though it was a really exciting fight as well. But uh, I'm hoping... Oh, I'm, see, I'm talking shit there because I'm saying I'm hoping for a Duffy win. Um, but I like James Vick a lot. He's so underrated. I mean, I watched the, the watch list, UFC 217 watch list with Sean Shelby, and it was funny to me that he says, where is... Like, he didn't know about James Vick and uh, where he's been coming from, and they didn't, they didn't know he was coming. The guy's been around the UFC for a long time, and you've seen his skill set get better. And I mean, he had that opportunity against a ranked opponent and got knocked out. That happens sometimes. It's just the the game that, that they're in. Now I think Joseph Duffy can maybe do the same here, but both guys, in all honesty, well, especially Joseph Duffy, he hasn't beat top level guys in the UFC either. I think James Vick has got a couple of guys in there that. Ray, Paul Reyes was just a fight I, I didn't really like. I mean, Duffy's faced Jake Lindsay, who's a freaking terrible fighter. Reza Madadi, who's on his way out as well. So, um, tough fight. I'm going to pick James Vick. Um, this is going to be a close fight. I'm going to pick him via a split decision. But, um, yeah, it's not going to be... It's a, it's a pick. I, f I feel more a little bit more comfortable confident going with James Vick because I do think he's underrated and I do think he's a legit skill set that can trouble a lot of guys and Duffy being one of them but uh, it's not a confident pick but the pick's going to be James Vick uh, I just want I'm looking forward to sitting down watching these two that like I said at the beginning of this fight breakdown like savages because that's what they are they, 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 they will beat guys in the top 15 both guys will I love matches like this where you put them together it was kind of like Sao Paulo last week where um, tight matchups. I like tight matchups, and it's 
you look into those fights and you try and find little snippets of where you're going to go. I've went back and forth on this if you probably haven't already seen with the way I'm babbling on and babbling on. But I'm going to pick James Vick via a very close 29-28 decision. Close fight, looking forward to it though. So that's the prelims out of the way, we're on to the pay-per-view portion of this card now. And we're starting off in the middleweight division with a former UFC welterweight champion in Johnny Hendricks. As he faces off against this Brazilian bulldozer in Paulo Borahina, eh, Bolashina, who has uh, come into the UFC two two wins in the UFC against probably two of the worst middleweights that you'll probably see in the UFC, in all honesty, in Gareth McClellan and Ulawali Bambose. I took some things away from that Bambose fight for the simple fact that he took shots from Bambose in that one there. Now, Bambose is a, a kind of wild, wild guy anyway, so he can catch you with stuff. But uh, Bambose took this guy down a couple of times. Now, Borishina popped straight back up and then he put a beat down on Bambose. But you saw things there that um, potentially Johnny Hendricks can expose. Johnny Hendricks, I think, is he's, he decided to go to Jackson Wink. And I think it's years far too late. I think he's pushing for something that's just not there anymore. Um, the size difference in this fight is going to be huge. I like what the UFC have done to put Borishina against a former UFC champion to try and... Because if this guy beats Hendricks, um, then he puts himself out there as being a UFC champion and they're not going to try and push him. They're going to put him in cards in Brazil and he, he might not be far off being a ranked opponent fairly soon as well um, within a couple of fights. I think that Borishina is going to come out and just want to put this on Johnny Hendricks. And I do see him finding big strikes in that first round to take Johnny Hendricks out. I don't think, with this guy coming forward, I think he will just bulldoze him a little bit. But I do have my reservations about Borishina. Now, I, I was, I'm was actually a guy, I've spoke about this guy before he was coming to the UFC. I really liked him. Um, he was an ultimate fighter obviously in Brazil but I liked what I seen when I watched his fights from um, Jungle Fight before he came into the UFC really like his skill set I like his attributes um, I like his, he's just a huge guy he's a big Adonis of a guy who has got a lot of skills but this is a clear step up from is it a clear, yeah it is a clear step up from the two guys he's faced but Johnny Hendricks is a shell of himself from a few years ago as well but if this fight goes into round two and round three, I favour Johnny Hendricks. I think he will get takedowns and I think he can control Borishina because Borishina has shown that he can gas out. But I'm going to go with the, what I think is the most logical pick and that's Borishina to come out quick and blast Johnny Hendricks. Um, the whole move to Jackson Winks is a little bit weird one to me. I just don't know what they can bring to his game this far in his career. Can they revitalise a guy like that? Now they've they have done so in the past with a few guys. Um, I just don't think it's going to happen here. Even if he's to win the fight, I don't see him really sticking around at Jackson Winks. So I can't pick Johnny Hendricks. I think he has a chance if the fight goes into second. I think he has a big chance. But I have to pick Paolo Borishina to come out here and just bulldoze him and uh, knock him out in the first round. So I'm going to go a first round stoppage for Paolo Borishina. In that one there. Great fight. Wow. Uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson against Gamebred Jorge Masvidal. Um, who, I love that. I love when he does that and, and, and looks away. I think it's pretty awesome. So, uh, Great fight. Really good fight. I love um, the skill set that Stephen Thompson has. I like that uh, Jorge Masvidal, I just, his game, his overall game is so awesome. That's another guy that's like severely severely underrated in so many aspects of the sport um watched some fights today and masvidal got dropped a few times against guys like people like michael Chiesa, um and i forgot who else there was there was a couple other guys but it, like he's so resilient he bounces straight back up and that was him fighting down at 155 pounds which was obviously a taxing thing on his body since he's went to 170 he's made um a great account on sale in that division absolutely brutalising Donald Cerrone I thought he fought really well against Damien Maia uh, I liked how he survived in that fight and gave himself opportunities I thought his IQ fight IQ was a little bit off trying to engage with Maia in some aspects of, of the grappling side of things there um, 
and just giving Maya things a little bit easy. But great discipline striker, um, really quick hands and can put beautiful combinations together. And it's just an underrated fighter. And uh, I know a lot of people uh, are high in him. I know uh, Justin from UFC Bropex is really high in Jorge Masvidal. I'm not as high as what other people are, but I do love watching him fight cause, because he is, I think he's one of the better guys in the UFC, like really elite guys with a great skill set. Um, but sometimes he drops the ball where he gets a little bit too comfortable in there and he doesn't throw enough. And that's how he loses very close decisions. So he has to be careful with that because Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is one of the best point fighters, I think, or he can be if he chooses to be one of the best point fight fighters with that karate style. Um, very light on his feet, throwing kicks, side kicks, um, keeping this guy at distance, hook kicks, crescent kicks, wheel kicks, you name it, whoever they are, this guy throws heavy, heavy shots. Um, coming off two tough fights though with Tyrone Woodley, he took his licks in that first fight in New York last year, um, had a smelly, smelly fight in that second one in Las Vegas earlier on this year. Um, he can beat Tyrone Woodley, I've no doubt about it, I think he's got a game that can, but Tyrone was just a little bit of a better fight in those two nights, um, in my opinion. I'm going to go with Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. I think it's this, the first round of this is going to be pivotal, I think. If Wonderboy comes out, I, I just see him winning one of the last two rounds. Not unless Masvidal hurts him, drops him, stops him. Um, I just think that Thompson's going to come out, he's going to, use, he's going to fight at range, um, use a lot of leg kicks... And just kind of keep Masvidal at bay. Masvidal's going to have to rush in a little bit to get some strikes off. Um, great striking though, Masvidal, like he really has got some great strikes. But I just think that Thompson's a really, really good point fight. And I think it's going to come to fruition in this fight here. And I think he's going to win a decision. Whether it's a, a 29... To, I, I see Masvidal at least winning one round in this one. I'd be very surprised if Thompson 30-27s him across the board. So... The pick is going to be Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Um, but I can probably see spots where Masvidal can win this fight as well. I just feel better picking Stephen Thompson. He needs this win coming off those two title fights to keep himself relevant in that title picture. Masvidal really needs this win to put himself back in there after losing to my night. It wasn't a bad loss, like I said. But if he can beat a guy like Stephen Thompson, who's probably the number one, number two guy in that division, if I remember right, he puts himself right in the shop window to face... Tyron Woodley, along with Colby Covington now, who's put himself right in the short window there. So, um, pick's going to be Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. 29-28 decision there. On to the first of our three UFC championship fights here with the Miss Violence herself, really. Joanna, Joanna champion, Joanna Jacek against Thug Rose Namajunas. Ah, uh, who doesn't love Joanna Jacek? I think she's... When you watch her fight, she is so fun to watch. She's so violent. Great pace. Obviously great striking. Great combinations. Very, very accurate. Doesn't have much power, but a hand speed's elite. Like and in in the women's division, I don't think I think she's just the best women's fighter across the board. And she's improved since she came into UFC. She's very hard to take down. She's taken some big shots and bounced back up. Uh, we've seen that with Kovalkiewicz, she caught with a nice shot. Uh, Gadelia dropped her with a couple of shots as well. So she can be hit and she can be hurt a little bit. But I'm going to make a bit of a bold statement here. I think this is going to be the easiest title defense that she's got. I think this is going to be the easiest fight she can have uh, for this title so far. I know she's faced Jessica Penny. Uh, well, I'm saying that, Jessica Penny. Shit, maybe uh, I'm talking at Mars there because... Jessica Penny really showed nothing for Yoni and Jacek. Valerie Ruturno didn't really have much either. But I just think mentally already, she's embedded herself in Rose Nami Yunus's head. And she's just going to... Really, I think she's going to light her up like a Christmas tree. I really do. What I like about Rose Nami Yunus is that what she brings to the table here, she's got a kicking game that not many other fighters have had or have had against Yoni and Jacek. So she could use that to the advantage. I mean, we've seen that with the, the Michelle Watson fight. She caught with a lovely head kick, which led to the finish there. She's got um, some crazy submissions out there as well. If she can maybe tie 
Yuan up against the cage, but Yuan is so good at angling off the cage and moving around that she's just she's just a hard fighter to fight. And I mean, I think she's beat better girls in that division. I think Andrade is better. I think Gadelia is better, and she's beat her twice. Um, I just think she's going to light Rose up here. If they get into a striking exchange, I think that Yuan Jacek is crisper. She's more accurate. She's faster. Uh, and she probably hits a little bit harder as well. And uh, I just don't see... I think Rose she has an opportunity if she gets it to the ground. She's definitely the better submission artist. Better... Um, just probably better control person down there. She can control the fight a little bit more than what if Yun Jacek was if she had top position or so on. I think that Rose would be very dangerous down there. I just don't see her getting close in this fight. I think Yuan is going to absolutely explode on her here. And I think she's going to stop her. I was kind of hoping this... Um, her number was going to come down. She's like minus 350, I think she is over here in the UK, which I am going to parlay up. She is going to be one of this bet. I'm, quite, I'm going to bet her with Max Holloway for nearly plus, just shy of plus money. Um, so hopefully a little bit of money comes in on Yuan and she can hit maybe minus 300, which would be awesome. And I could parlay them up for plus money, her and Max Holloway. Um, but I'm just going to wait and see how fight week goes. And if she's still minus 350 around fight title, I will probably bet her in some aspect there. So... Um, I think Yuan is just going to run through her. I really do. I've just got that feeling she's going to destroy Rose Nama Yunus. She's Rose has lost to lesser strikers. Carolina Carl was absolutely devastating in the clinch on the striking as well. And it hurt her in that fight. I think that Yuan is just going to beat that ass. I really do. I'm going to go a fourth round stoppage for Yuan and Jacek via strikes. And I don't see anybody beating her in that division. I really don't see anybody touching her. Um, what I liked about what Sean Shelby said on that the watch list, like he needs to try and find girls that are going to come in and beat her. And even he's struggling. He knows he, he she's beat the elite of that division already. There is people out there. I think Ar Ariana Lipsky, the KSW champion, could give her a run for her money. Maybe not now, but in a couple of years' time. So uh, Yuan is going to be the pick. And uh, we'll see where she goes from here. She may face Andrade again. She may face Kovalkiewicz. Um, but she's running out of people to beat in that division already. So we may see her move up to 125, which she can have great fights up there with Valentina and become a two-time champion, uh, two, maybe a two-division champion. Who knows? Um, Yuan is the pick. I think she's just going to... I think she's going to destroy Rose Namunas here. Ooh, what a fight this is. UFC bantamweight champion Cody Garbrandt faces off against former UFC bantamweight champion TJ Dillashaw. Now, this fight has so many aspects of it, from being old sparring partners to obviously both guys fighting from the same gym, being on the ultimate fighter, having their fight cancelled. Um, and now we're finally going to get this fight, and I cannot wait. This, I've been talking on... If you've been following me, if you follow me on Twitter, I've been talking about this fight so much recently. I mean, today I was posting videos of good, good things Cody Garbrandt did with Dominic Cruz, where he dropped him with a beautiful counter right hook, um, a beautiful like uh, takedown in the first round as well. You all know I'm a massive Cody Garbrandt fan. I've been calling this guy. I called him a champion a long time ago. Stupidly picked him against. Uh, stupidly picked Thomas Almeida against him. Um, a little while back and I was made to eat crow and I made a silly silly decision there considering I was claiming this guy was going to be a champion um, and that performance against Dominic Cruz was an absolute masterclass across four rounds I think I, I gave him four rounds in that fight pretty easily um, really good footwork really like he just mixed it up very well he had that takedown in the first nice leg kicks some nice body kicks and he just really, he figured out Dominic Cruz like nobody could before. Now, in saying that, there was alpha male guys that had fought him beforehand. So, and like Justin Buckholz, he had like 27, 27 rounds against this guy. So, um, they knew what they were expecting, the game plan very well. And he, he executed amazingly well. The one thing with Cody Garbrandt, which I think he's got over a lot of people in that division, this guy has serious power and if he catches you he drops everybody he literally drops every fighter that he's faced i think if i can remember right in his ufc tenure so maybe maybe briones did he did he um he did he did drop him in that fight as well yeah i remember I was there 
uh, he can put you down like he did with Dominic Cruz. I mean, that counter right hook in the fourth was a beautiful shot. Dropped him twice in that round, if I remember right. Um, and yeah, it was just... I was mesmerised by his performance. I really was. Talking about TJ Dillashaw here, he's a fighter that's evolved so much since his stint in Ultimate Fighter, where John Dodson knocked him out. Went with Bang Ludwig, had really good footwork. Now, this was pointed out to me by... Dan Levy today, half the battle, and I went back and watched the fights. If you watched that first fight with Henan Barrow when he knocked him out, footwork was unbelievable. His movement and his angles were unbelievable. But if you got, you watch his recent few fights against Aswin Sao, against John Lineker, it's not as defined as what it was in that fight against Barrow. And that's a great point, and that's from coming from a, a guy in Dan Levy who's who spots same things. And it, it made me question, I was like, because hey, I, I never saw that. So that's why you listen to some of these. This is why I listen to some of the other guys because they can point out things that I didn't see. You go back and watch and like, oh shit, he was actually right there, and you've seen that. So maybe his footwork's not as it's maybe fallen off a little bit. So I I actually gave him when it comes to footwork and maybe speed of his feet. I thought that maybe um, TJ would win that uh, aspect of the fight, but maybe after watching the the Cruz fight again today. Um, I think it's pretty even. Maybe Cody's got the advantage there. I think what TJ has to do, he has to really mix it up very well. Um, I think that Cody is the faster striker. I think he's the faster hands. Obviously, the more powerful hands. What TJ has to do is execute a really good kicking game and maybe try and mix it in with takedowns. Now, Dominic Cruz got in on a takedown and Cody Garbrandt and Cody Garbrandt popped straight back up, literally reversed the position and got straight back to his feet. I don't think he'll keep Cody there. But I think the majority of this fight is going to stay standing. And when it stays standing, I think that Cody Garbrandt is the better striker. Now, overall striking, we're saying that Cody Garbrandt, I thought he kicked very well in that fight with Dominic Cruz. Some nice leg kicks, some nice body kicks, like I said. Dillashaw can throw them up high a little bit. But, I mean, Garbrandt's a small dude. He can probably duck below a lot of them. Um, I just think Cody's the faster guy. And like Sean Shelby said, I think speed, who's the fastest guy who's going to win this fight? And I think that Garbrandt is the faster guy. And saying that, the one thing that kind of worries me is the back problem that he had. When you have a back problem, that's a huge, huge injury to have in MMA. And uh, it kind of worries me a little bit. But I like the fact that he stayed out a long time from that fight in December. Uh, he was supposed to fight, obviously, in June or July at UFC whatever it was in the in the summer there where he was supposed to, I think it was supposed to be the main event on that card, maybe? Maybe not, I can't remember now. Um, pulled out, UFC were definitely trying to keep him in that fight and he's got that extra three, four months to recuperate, get his body in order, he's going to become a dad, he's got engaged, uh, so shout out to Cody for that. I'm going to pick Cody Garbrandt here, I think he is just the better... I think he's the better overall fight. I think this guy is going to be a star in this division for years to come, and I've said that for a for a few years now. I'm just a complete huge fan of this guy. It's not a if I saw aspects where T.G. Dillashaw could win this fight, I would pick T.G. Dillashaw. I think he can make it close, but I think that Cody Garbrandt is just the better fight, and I think um, I think that T.G. thought he could maybe get in the head of Cody a little bit, and I don't think that Cody he, he let that happen. Um, Nobody knows like TJ Dillashaw better than the Alpha Male guys, so they're going to game plan, find the perfect game plan here for Cody Garbrandt. The thing is, do I pick him for a stoppage? Um, no, I think that I think that goes to decision and he wins like a 49-46 decision. Uh, I would like to see a stoppage. I really would. I'd lose my shit if he if he stopped TJ um, in this one. But I'm going to pick Cody Garbrandt. I'm going to pick him via decision. Uh, pretty hefty across the board, three scorecards, all in his favour, so Cody Garbrandt is the winner there, in my opinion. And the main event of the night, Michael the Count Bisbin defending his title for the second time against George Ross St. Pierre. Now, I've been, I think I'm like a lot of fans that's really not bothered too much about this fight. Um, I haven't been, but as the fight gets closer, I must admit, I am intrigued by this fight. Um, but I am very... And, and go back to the Garbrandt fight as well. I have four units on him at plus, minus 135 to win. Um, I'm very intrigued to see George St. Pierre back. But ultimately, I think Michael Bisbon is just... 
I think Michael Bisbane's going to beat on George St. Pierre a little bit. Before GSP left, he was getting beat up badly against Johnny Hendricks. His face in that fight, at the end of that fight, was horrific. Been out four years. The game's evolved so much. And I've seen, I actually watched Embedded before I started doing this. And he looks like he's got like the Chuck Liddell pot belly. Like, he looks like he. He doesn't, I don't think he looks in the best of shape, but in saying that, he has been away for four years. He has aged, obviously. What would you, what was GSP the best at when he was dominating the welterweight division? An all-around superior athlete, like a superior athlete. Anything he tried his hand at, he was amazing. Um, from not having a wrestling background to like really just wrestling guys and dominating them the way he did uh, was incredible. I thought he's striking. He, he, he's always had um, a beautiful jab, which he's worked on and got better. He's training with Freddie Roach. Freddie Roach is going to be in his corner for this one. Um, I just think that um, this is going to be a little bit too much, but Bisping's been out for over a year as well. He took his licks in that Dan Henderson fight, and ultimately he could have lost that fight. Um, I thought it was very close, and I was in the arena. I thought he was getting stopped. I was one of the only pe people probably picking Dan Henderson in that fight, yeah, or wanting Dan Henderson in that arena to win. There was me and John... Really wanting uh, Henderson to win, but I mean, he's came back. He's like he's beat. Look at the names that he's beat as well. He's beaten Rockhold, Anderson Silva. Now I know he's not in his prime. Dan Henderson, that was his last fight. Um, and he's got George Saint Pierre there. So if he wins this, he's beat three of the like the all-time greats in these last three fights, um, three or four fights. So it's crazy to see where Bisbon uh, has kind of came through. I thought he was going to retire, and then he comes in and he knocks out Rockhold and. Uh, yeah, it's it, it, yeah. I've never been the biggest fan of Bisbane, but fair play to the guy. He's done a lot for the UK market, the European MMA market, and deserves the recognition that he's getting at the minute. With the uh, he probably going to the UFC Hall of Fame, definitely going to the UFC Hall of Fame. So how do I see this matchup going? I think that Bisbane's just going to be too big. I think he's he is durable. I don't think the GSP has the power to like really hurt. Like Michael Bisbane, I don't see it. Um, do I see George St. Pierre potentially wrestling with Bisbane? I think that's going to be, have to be his game plan. I think that Bisbane is very, it's always been really underrated with his grappling and his wrestling. So I see him maybe getting taken down a couple of times, but I see him popping back up and uh, stopping some takedowns as well. I think over the five rounds, I think that he's just going to get off more strikes in the round, accumulate more damage. Uh, and I just think that four-year gap and coming back and fighting such a, a guy that's going to probably be outweigh him by 20, 30 pounds on fight night maybe, um, it's going to be a little bit too much. So um, interesting to see GSP back. If you've been around for the longest time like I have, GSP was the man back in the day. He really was. He was the pay-per-view king. Um, but I can't pick him in this fight. I would actually like him to win, but hey... Um, smart money's on Michael Bisman and he was the underdog which was freaking batshit crazy when I seen that um, I bet two units at plus 105 so I've got a dog play there in that one so the pick's going to be Michael Bisman can he finish it? I think he can does he finish it? I don't think he does so um, Michael Bisman to win via decision so that's my pick's for this really solid card I'm looking forward to at UFC 217. I appreciate the idea. If you've been with me from the start, it's nearly 50 minutes, but I really enjoyed talking about this card. I hope you've enjoyed listening. Continue to subscribe, like, um, and comment. I love reading your comments. Last week we had some great uh, comments in the drop-down boxes discussing the fight. I love seeing shit like that. Uh, so keep that coming. MMA Huddle My Podcast. Come and listen to us across all varieties of formats there. I'll be back. I'm probably going to make this video for Pets Pori this Thursday, so two or three days. I've already watched tape on my day off yesterday, um, and I've watched some fights today, so I will probably watch a few more over the next few days. Get that out. Uh, I'm going to be playing big on DraftKings this week, so hopefully... And shout out to Kyle Marley, who absolutely cashed his ass off uh, last Saturday, like $11,000. Going to the qualifier. I won, won the qualifier there, so um, shout out to those guys. Uh, shout out to Kyle Sorry and shout out to all the DraftKings guys who I speak to week in week out regarding the fights. I really appreciate you guys listening. Get let's get me to 1500 before the, the end of this year. We're, we're close already. 27, uh, I think we're, we've got left. Um, 
and enjoy this card when it comes round. I'm really looking forward to, to Garbrandt Dillashaw especially. Take care, enjoy your fights, and I will see you and speak to you very, very soon. All the best. Thank you very much.